All right, we'll get started. So I appreciate uh, you guys coming in tonight. I didn't introduce myself last week. So my name is Jerry Hahn, and I work for Sirius. I work for the corporate relations or with the corporate relations group there. So I do a lot of the work with the uh, our corporate partners that help us support Sirius and, and do the things we do. So. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce the speaker today. This is Ben Harsha. He's a computer science PhD student and he's advised by Professor Jeremiah Blocky. He currently works on password security and cryptographic hash functions. Before coming to Purdue, he worked as a distributed sensor networks at Argonne National Labs, as well as uh, neural network optimization computer science education methods at DePaul. He received his master's from Purdue and a bachelor's from DePaul. So I'll turn it over to Ben Harsha. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, again, my name is Ben Harsha, and today I'm going to talk to you all about an upcoming paper that we have at IEEE s and uh, uh, in a few months here called The Economics of Offline Password Hashing. This is joint work with uh, Professor Blocky, myself, and Samson Zhou, who is uh, another Purdue student. So to start off, um, we're going to be dealing with offline password cracking here, and I think it's important to at least do a quick review of kind of the basics and the background uh, of what exactly we're dealing with and what sort of systems we are going to be handling today. So first, it's important to understand exactly what sort of password storage we are dealing with here. So uh, if you are registering an account uh, on any service, in this case, it looks like a PlayStation, you're going to send over a username and some password along with it. Now, when the service receives it, they are going to store a record that contains your username. Uh, they are also going to have a randomly generated section called the salt. And what they are going to do is they're going to take your password, concatenate the salt in some fashion, and then hash the combination of the two to get a final record that they store. Uh, and the purpose of this is essentially that you never are going to store a plain text password, and you are salting to prevent uh, what's called a rainbow table attack, which is where you are able to just pre-hash a bunch of common passwords and essentially look at the hash and do a quick lookup to find people's passwords. So this is the standard way that passwords are stored. And uh, unfortunately, what inevitably tends to happen is that these companies uh, make some mistake and an adversary manages to get all of these records. And uh, once you have these records, what can then happen is an offline attack, which is what we will be talking about today. And in this case, they have your username, your salt, and the hash of your salt and password. And they can toss this into some local machine and run some program like John the Ripper and try to brute force attack your password. So you'd like these to be like an uncommon and rare situation. But unfortunately, uh, if you've been reading the news in the past few years, these have become a common problem, as you can see from our, our little wall of shame here. Uh, and this is not just limited to you know, smaller companies, but even pretty big names like Yahoo or even security related companies like LastPass uh, have had breaches in the past few years that release records of this type. So there are a few key questions that we are hoping to answer today. And the first is, can we predict how many users' passwords a rational attacker will crack after a breach? So what sort of number, what sort of percentages are we looking at losing through this? And there are a lot of factors that we need to handle to be able to answer this question. So we need to know exactly what a password is worth uh, to an attacker, literally in terms of money in this case. We need to know how much it is costing them to make every single guess they are going to perform to try to crack your password. We need to know things about the market, such as diminishing returns. And what I mean here is, say that you're an attacker trying to sell a lot of these passwords. What happens if you were to, say, flood the market and release a million, a million at once? Are you going to maybe reduce the, uh, the value of each one as you're releasing more and more? And of course, uh, the strength of user passwords or how likely they are to be guessed is also another one of the factors we care about. Given these factors, we also want to find uh, or answer the question, are the NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, minimal guidelines sufficient to protect users? So NIST releases, um, releases a document that does lay out a few guidelines for what sort of hashing functions you should use, what sort of parameters need to be done uh, or put into these functions, and we want to know are these current recommendations sufficient? And we also want to look at something called memory hard functions to see if these help alleviate the problem somewhat. Um, 
So we know that these are getting leaked, but how do you actually go about defending them? We've already talked about these first two here, which is hashing, which is just essentially forcing some sort of brute force at some point, and salting to prevent these rainbow table attacks. There is a third method that is used as, uh, as a defense against these called key stretching. And the idea of key stretching is just take these functions that they are trying, uh, computing again and again to do their brute force and artificially make them expensive to compute. So um, this can be done in a few different ways, this artificial difficulty increase. Um, but the basic idea and why you want to do this is you want to take the cost of this function here on the slide, it's just h, uh, and if you assume that that costs some amount, looks like one coin here to compute, all we're going to do is try to raise that to some amount so that instead of paying one unit for every single time they're computing this, they're going to be paying, say, K in this case, units uh, of cost or currency, uh, whatever you have, uh, to compute every single guess. There are a few ways this is done. Uh, hash iteration is a pretty common one. This is used by Bcrypt, for example, which is a a hash function that was used in several, um, several breaches that have happened. Uh, and there's another way to do this that works with memory hard functions, uh, but we will get a little bit in, uh, more into that in a bit. Looking at hash iteration though, as one of the methods of key stretching, the idea is pretty simple. All you're gonna do is you take this hash function that was used. Uh, so if we're looking at bcrypt, for example, which is a pretty common one, uh, the base function would just be blowfish is what it's called. Uh, and you are just going to repeat this over and over again by instead of storing the hash of your information, you store the hash of the hash of the hash of the hash of the hash, and you just continue this on for some set number of time. Uh, memory hardness, the second version that we mentioned, is uh, a memory hard function is a function that requires not only a large amount of time to compute, but it also requires a large amount of memory. And it has uh, quadratic area time complexity, which I'll get into a little bit uh, more later on, uh, which provides several advantages when we are defending against these offline attacks. So what we want to do is we want to develop an economic model for an adversary that is going and doing one of these offline attacks. So what do we assume? We assume that we have this adversary and that they are able to sell these passwords on the black market, essentially, for some value. They really only care about one thing and one thing only, and that is making a profit. They don't care about the number they crack. They don't care uh, essentially how long, it uh, how long it takes. The only thing they want is a profit. They are just interested in money. So essentially what we're gonna see is that we're gonna have this rational economic adversary who's going to keep guessing and trying to crack a password as long as it is profitable for them to do so. And what we want is we want our model to in the end, let us predict what percentage of passwords are going to be cracked by this adversary. Um, so again, reiterating, uh, they have this list of hash passwords, uh, this form of the record that we showed earlier. They're able to sell it on the uh, black market. Uh, they do have some restrictions though. So there's some operating costs associated with this. Every time they make a guess, we're going to assume that they do have to pay some sort of cost, even if it is very small, to make that guess. Um, and so at this point, we've got a bunch of, th uh, we've got a situation in an adversary we're dealing with. Uh, we've got a few more questions that we need to answer. So things we need to answer to really come up with some sort of model and to be able to answer our questions are, uh, well, how much does it cost to actually make these guesses? What are their operating costs, essentially? Uh, how probable are certain passwords? This is important because we need to know for each guess, how likely is it that they are going to succeed? And uh, kind of an interesting question, how much is your password worth? Uh, what are people actually out there paying for these passwords after they have been cracked? So we'll go through these and Hope they'll uh, give you guys an answer for all of them. So the first problem we had is finding how much does it cost to make every single guess, which is just a parameter we're going to call k here. Uh, a lot of these functions, such as bcrypt, scrypt, or pbkdf2, have some sort of time parameter, t, that uh, gets put in here. Essentially a parameter that says how long should you run this function or how expensive should it be to compute. 
They are usually based on some sort of underlying function like SHA-256 or Blowfish, and uh, in the case of bcrypt or BPK, P, pbkdf2, these are just being run again and again in this hash iteration method. Um, so we just have two steps here when we're dealing with these hash iteration methods, which is first we just need the cost of the underlying function, and then we're just going to multiply this by the time parameter uh, t to get our final cost. So how much does it cost to make a single guess? It is just the cost of whatever the base function is times however many times you're calculating the base function. And this will give us an idea of what it costs to make every single guess. So how much do they cost? Um, We've got a few estimates here. So back in 2014, Bonneau came to an estimate of 7 times 10 to the negative 15th dollars, that's US dollars, uh, per calculation of SHA-256. Uh, he actually did this by analyzing the, uh, the amount of hashes that were performed for a while on the Bitcoin network, uh, and essentially compared that with the rewards that the miners were getting and used this as a way to estimate how much is it costing or how much is a single calculation worth. Uh, so that was back in 2014. We actually have one from a few months ago, just kind of some back of the napkin calculations. Uh, there is a piece of hardware called the Antminer S9 that's out, for example, and it is just a dedicated piece of hardware that does nothing but compute uh, SHA-256. Uh, it can do 14 trillion calculations of this function per second. Uh, and given this, the amount that it costs, uh, how much electricity it, uh, it uses, which is well published and in their specs, uh, and based on how much electricity costs, we can actually come up with an idea of what does it cost to run these functions on something like this. Uh, in this case, we are looking at about 10 to the negative 18 dollars to compute every single uh, Base, hash to, uh, base SHA-256 evaluation. Here's the big point right here. These are cheap. It is incredibly cheap to calculate these, and you can do a lot uh, with a single dollar even. Uh, so next, we've got our base function. All we need to do is that final step here. Multiply this by whatever our time parameter t was, and let's see what it would cost to make guesses given some certain breaches. So here is... Uh, a nice interesting table, at least I think. This is showing a lot of breaches that have happened in the past five or six years. Uh, so from these, we actually do know, in many cases, exactly which function they were using. We know how many iterations they were doing, um, seeing as all of these were using hash iteration. Well, uh, unless you're linked, in which case they were just doing a single SHA-1 and not doing any key stretching. Um, and from this, we can actually look and figure out what these costs are. So if you can look through here, it ranges and varies wildly. And it depends very much on what parameters they've picked. If you are attacking uh, the LinkedIn set right here, uh, you can imagine that every single, uh, every single guess that you're making is 7 times 10 to the negative 15th dollars, which is, uh, I mean, exceedingly cheap. Uh, or we have breaches such as LastPass, where they had much higher key stretching parameters which bumps up the cost per guess that you're making. So still pretty small at 7 times 10 to the negative 10th, um, but a lot better than if nothing had been done at all. So given our little table here, uh, we can actually say that we know how much, or we have estimates for how much it costs to make every single guess. And so now we need to know, for each of these guesses, how likely is it that the guess is going to succeed? And from this, we need to know, well, how probable are certain passwords? Uh, and to do this, essentially to find out how likely each guess is to succeed, we need the distribution of passwords. So uh, I don't know if you guys have seen anything like this before. These are actually lists of the most common passwords, uh, this being a security group and the people watching it being a security group. I hope yours is not up here. If it is, come talk to me afterwards, please. We need to have a little chat. Uh, but we want to know how probable all are, uh, are all of these. There's actually some previous work out here on this that gives us a nice starting point. Uh, Wang et al. published something uh, a few years ago uh, that was uh, giving the idea that passwords follow something called Zip's law. Uh, so this was originally a law that was found in natural languages and how common certain words are. Uh, it turns out that uh, there's a lot of evidence that passwords are following this law as well. 
What is Zipf's law? Well, essentially, it's just this formula that you see on the board here. Uh, the probability of a password P is just C divided by I, or whatever ranked password we want to pick, to the power of S. C and S here are just some parameters that you can find. Um, and you just plug them in. And so if I want, say, the most common password, I'm just going to plug I equals 1 here. I have C and S. And you can just you know, turn the crank and figure out how likely uh, a password would be if this is what happens. So, uh, And what it kind of looks like is just an image there of a general basic idea of what Zip's law distributions look like. So we have a lot of very common passwords, and then it starts to taper off towards the end. Uh, why does this matter? Why does it matter that passwords follow Zip's law? Well, first off, it's actually pretty easy to check if something follows Zip's law, and we can get these parameters pretty quickly as long as we have the right information uh, available. And we can use this to pretty quickly calculate how likely a certain password is. Again, all I have to do is if I have these parameters, I just take whatever password I want. Say I want the fifth most common password, plug that five in, I get an answer out very nice and cleanly. Uh, so essentially by finding these parameters, what we can do is we can use a zip distribution in place of the discrete distribution, which is just the, the actual list that we have. Uh, and plug this in, and uh, essentially it makes math a lot nicer to work with, and we can come up with some nice closed form expressions that we can give. So now we need these parameters. Uh, and to do that, we are actually going to look at a, uh, a password set that had not been looked at before in terms of Zip's law. So in 2016, Yahoo allowed the release of some password data on purpose this time in differentially private form. Uh, what does this mean essentially in a sentence or two? It means that the way this was released is done in a way that's not going to endanger users. Their privacy is preserved. You can't tell if a certain person is or isn't in this data set. Um, and when I say it's the release of password data, I do not mean that they are releasing like, you know, the most common password was one, two, three, four, five, six. Rather, we're looking at something like the most common password was picked 400,000 times. The second most common password was picked 300,000 times and so on down the list. So this is the type of information we're looking at. Uh, there are about 70 million records in this password set that we have, which is more than twice as much that has been analyzed in terms of Zip's law before. Uh, so we're dealing with a lot more data. In addition, this data actually has several additional advantages that make it very nice to work with for our purposes. So, uh, first off, it is much larger than the previously analyzed sets. We have about 70 million records here. Uh, the largest one that was looked at by Wang et al. was Rocku, which is about 33 million uh, users. So we've about doubled it. Um, and of course, more data is always better. It's going to give you, hopefully, better answers and more accurate ones. Uh, this was also collected in a trusted fashion. So in a lot of these breaches, they were obtained through uh, less than scrupulous means when they were released. Um, so how much do you trust them? That's one question. Uh, how much do you trust the data in them? Well, I guess you can't be absolutely sure. But what we do know here is that this was collected by an, a well-known researcher. Um, and it was done in a responsible manner. Uh, so another benefit here is that these leaked sets often contain some suspiciously faked accounts. So I mentioned Rocky a moment ago. Uh, that was a breach a few years ago that was actually in plain text. Uh, and so if you actually look at a lot of the, like that password word cloud earlier, that's based on data taken from here. But if you actually were to sit down and scroll through it, uh, you'd find that there are a lot of suspicious entries. Um, some passwords, for example, that are maybe just, you know, long HTML uh, strings or a few SQL injection attack attempts uh, rather than actual legitimate users. So, well, these may be, you know, not exactly real accounts or real people that we're dealing with. Um, so it's collected in secure fashion is another benefit. Uh, not actually releasing anyone's actual passwords, as I said, but just some, some aggregate data, essentially. Uh, and here's a nice one, is that the data is from active users, not from throwaway accounts. Uh, so we know that we're dealing with, with real accounts, not just you know, one-off accounts that people make to sign up for some spam thing online. Uh, these are our actual users. <coughs> Uh, so 
I mentioned that it was released in a in some in a different released with differential privacy. What exactly does it mean? It does mean that the data has been perturbed a bit. Some of the numbers have been changed slightly in a way that ensures that you can't really tell if somebody is or is not in this data set. Uh, so there are perturbations and we want to double check and make sure, are these perturbations going to cause any problems in our analysis? Will they throw our numbers off? So claim, no, it's fine, it works anyways. Uh, the perturbations are small enough that we can still come up with good answers. And we show this by, um, by giving some strong empirical evidence based on RockQ. So with RockQ, unlike Yahoo, we do actually have the list of everyone's records. And we can go through and actually apply the same process that was applied to Yahoo um, and do this a bunch of times and then compare the outputs before and after this process has been done to see how much of a change we get. Uh, so I will just toss up a table quickly. Uh, sorry for the wall of numbers, but what we're looking at essentially here uh, on the left under Y and R, these are um, some parameters that we're looking for. Uh, we can see that they're not off by much, uh, maybe a few thousandths, uh, but nothing uh, very significant. Um, and we have a standard deviation to the right. All that's saying uh, is that with that being very small, it's not going to move around much. We're going to get a pretty consistent answer when we are uh, when we're using differential privacy. So uh, we know that it should work here. And the last step is actually to go ahead and fit the data. Um, so what you're looking at here is actually a plot of how likely certain passwords are in Yahoo. Um, and if you put it on, uh, on a log log scale like this, you actually can just uh, use a nice simple linear regression. And the nice thing here is that this is how you are going to grab your zip parameter. So uh, without going into too much detail, um, in this case, Y and R are zip parameters and just using uh, some method of uh, linear regression, you're going to grab those parameters and now we can plug those into our analysis. And after looking at it, we actually found uh, that our parameters do fit in nicely with other sets. Nothing that, uh, nothing that we got out was unexpected or too different from other password sets. It seems definitely well within the ranges that we can see. Um, so if you're just looking here, you can see that the numbers are, they're well within the ranges that we're seeing for other sets here. And so this was the, uh, the end goal. We actually do have our parameters here, which gives us our distribution that we can work with. Uh, so with that, I believe we have two questions down. So next, uh, the interesting question of how much are people going to pay for your password? Uh, there's a few estimates that we have here. So a few years ago, Symantec released a report saying that passwords can range anywhere from $4 to $30 on the black market. Um, and we have some newer estimates from, uh, from more recent, uh, um, some more recent uh, articles saying that uh, some of them will go from 70 cents to $1.20. And I believe these are actually from Yahoo uh, specifically. So definitely relevant for what we're looking at. Of course, this is just an average uh, Bill Gates bank password's worth a little bit more. Grad student like mine bank uh, password is probably worth a little less. Uh, but on, on average, this is kind of what we're looking at. 70 cents to $1.20. Uh, that's roughly what you're going to get for a password on the black market. So we can now use this with the other uh, breach data because uh, we now know. Yes. So, so uh, can you go back? Yeah. Yes. So how profit how how probable is each password? So you gave the oh, sorry, from here? Or? Yes. You, you gave the data. So what does this tell us? So what this is, uh, remember that when I mentioned Zip's law, uh, it's based on two parameters. Uh, they've been renamed here actually. Uh, so Y and R. So if you have these two parameters, what you can do is we have a nice formula where these two parameters combined with whatever password you want. So if you want the, the most common password, for example, uh, you can plug in, you can basically just pass this all to a function. So you pass Y, R, and I, which is the index of the password you want, um, and essentially turn the crank and get the, the password that you want. Um, so if you're talking more about this, I guess, visually, how probable are certain passwords? Uh, this is actually showing not the probability of the ith password, but the probability 
so the sum, a running sum essentially of what we have. Uh, so you can see in the bottom left right here that we have the most common password looks like it's oh, 1.2% of all passwords um, and it kind of carries on for there. So I don't know if I answered your question, but. <coughs> yeah, kind of, but like how much time, I think we, we, we need a time, right? We need how much time like to solve. We so we're not worrying about time right, near, uh, right here. All we care about is how likely is it uh, that this is the password that the user has picked. So for example, uh, what's the probability that the password 123456 was picked by this user you're trying to crack right now? Uh, in some ways, uh, I, guess, I guess what you're getting at with time is you know, how long are you going to go and what's the probability that you're going to get it within that time. Uh, and uh, I don't actually have slides on that, but essentially it's something that we work with in our model, which is figuring out um, essentially how many are going to be cracked with certain numbers of guesses, I guess. Okay. okay. All right. So we have these three answered. We know how much it costs to make a guess. We know how probable certain passwords are, and we know roughly what people are paying for these. So we want to now put this all together. So we have a rational adversary who's going to keep guessing as long as it is profitable. And we develop a formula that takes these zip parameters that we found for our distributions alongside a diminishing returns factor A, uh, what this is, uh, as I briefly mentioned at the beginning, this idea that as you're releasing more and more passwords onto the market, uh, supply and demand starts kicking in, the price is gonna uh, start dropping, is the idea on this. So we have some factor in here uh, that, mo uh, that models how quickly is the price going to drop as more and more are released. Given these parameters, we can come up with this, uh, this threshold of doom, essentially, T. Uh, and what this means is that if the ratio between the password value and the cost to make each guess is above some number that we can calculate, then the adversary should try to crack 100% of passwords. That is, it is always profitable for them to keep guessing, and they should keep going as long as they can to make as much money as they possibly can. Uh, so I will just toss up a bunch of crazy formulas here on the board for just a second. Uh, I know it's a little messy, but here's the key takeaway from this. We've got our five parameters here. Uh, the password, I'll well, going in order, Y and R are zip parameters. We have that. We got it from the Yahoo data set. We have A, which is our diminishing returns, which we can set to uh, whatever we want to model. In this case, we're usually going to use about 0 0.8. It's a number between 0 and 1. So 0 0.8 in the cases we're about to see. Uh, v, the password value, we're going to be able to get that from the estimates I gave a few minutes ago. And K, cost to compute each guess, essentially. Yes? So, Ben, when you use 0.8 for A, mm -hmm. are you saying that basically the worst case is if they flood the market, the value of the passwords will diminish down to 80%? So it doesn't mean that exactly. It works essentially um, as an exponent. Uh, you can think of. So as it's decreasing, you're going to get the value that's going to start to drop off over time. Uh, it doesn't mean that a pa once the market is flooded, 80% will happen. Uh, it's just a factor of how fast is it decreasing. Okay, so uh, we do have this formula, and while it may, uh, may look a bit complicated up here, hopefully uh, you all believe that you could go through and you could probably code this up uh, and you'd be able to make a function, plug in these numbers and get some answer out. <clears throat> so let's actually take a look at uh, where we stand with all of these previous breaches and where this threshold happens to land. So uh, we will show these for a few leaks, uh, actually for a few leaks such as Dropbox, actually Madison LastPass, the data was leaked in a way that doesn't let us calculate the zip parameters. We just don't have enough information or the right kind of information. But we do know, for example, uh, what their hashing parameters were. So I showed on the table earlier Dropbox. They run Bluefish 256 times, which is bcrypt. Uh, we do know that, and we should be able to use this to take a look at how much that would have protected our users. So we have a chart here. Um, what you're looking at, essentially on the, along the x-axis, we will be increasing our cost as we go to the right, the cost to make each guess. And then on the y-axis, we just have the value of a password once it's cracked. 
our curves that are kind of going off to the right here are, uh, are these thresholds, essentially. And remember, if we are above that, uh, well, we're doomed. So if we land here, we can say that an adversary should try to crack 100% of passwords because it is always worth their time to keep going. Uh, now for the two depressing button clicks here, uh, we actually find that when you are going through all these breaches and given their key stretching parameters, we are going to land well above this threshold. So uh, actually let's zoom in a little bit. Um, so essentially on the top here, uh, between 0 0.3, 0 0.5, that's uh, roughly the password value estimates we had. Even if we are being um, pessimistic and assuming the password's not really worth that much for them and that they are, uh, they're working on the last pass breach, which of the, the breaches we were looking at earlier had the highest parameters, even in this most pessimistic for the attacker case, it's still worth their time to do this. Um, and we do find that it is uh, essentially always profitable for them to keep trying to crack uh, passwords. So given our current values for passwords and hash function parameters, adversaries are going to keep working until they crack 100% of passwords that follow Zip's law. And here is our first lesson. That is the amount of key stretching that is being done by companies involved in these leaks is dramatically insufficient. It's not really protecting anyone. Yes? Did you look at, for example, if you get all this equipment in configuration to just crack, let's say, 10, 10 accounts or 10 passwords, you're not going to pay off all that investment. Is uh, there some point above number of potential passwords you can crack that you say, okay, now we're into that worth it? So that's, that's going to, here's how you would handle that uh, and how we handle it. Uh, essentially, Equipment cost is how you, wait, wait, that's what you're trying to. Yeah, I mean, there's, get at. there's like enough front capital. So yeah. there's the, there's the mm -hmm. O and M, and then there's the capital expense. Yes, so there's up. the startup costs. Right. Essentially. Yeah. So at what point in time do you cover your startup costs? The way you handle that is you actually do work that into the cost to compute each hash function. So uh, I mentioned Antminer S9 earlier, and we gave an estimate for how much it costs to to compute each base function with the Antminer S9. That actually does factor in the cost of equipment. So you can factor in the cost of these, uh, whatever hardware you're using into whatever our cost parameter is, uh, is down here, or the cost to make each guess. Essentially, it's factored into your guessing cost is, is the way to put it. And so yeah, you can handle that, and that's how you do it. Um, where were we? OK, so yes. Um, amount of key stretching done by companies, not sufficient to really protect people. Um, and even if good enough values uh, are picked, and uh, I sort of say good enough uh, in some way, uh, even if you are, say, not in this red zone right here and you're just a little bit to the right, all that's saying is that only 99% of people lost their accounts. Uh, so that's still maybe not good. If we really want to get to some good levels, the delay or the cost that you have to pay or charge for each guess starts to become intolerable not to just to the attackers, but also intolerable for the users. And we'll see a, a more dramatic case of that in a moment here. Uh, I do want to say this with a grain of salt. Uh, we are assuming that the, the, that the distribution is truly following what's called CDF Zips law, which is just um, the, the um, cumulative density function version of it, basically a running sum of probability rather than the probability of the ith password. Uh, but it is hard to say that the tail of the distribution actually follows Zip's law. Um, the reason for this is once you get towards the end of these lists, you have the users who've actually gone through and picked passwords that nobody else has picked. And seeing as we only have it showing up once, it is, uh, it's essentially not enough data to really go through and say for sure that this tail, the, the infrequent passwords are really following Zip's law. So it's just a case of there's not enough passwords, so there's not enough data to make strong claims for the people who have picked, say, a unique password. But it does hold as long as passwords do follow this pattern. Uh, and from the charts earlier, hopefully I've convinced you that a lot of them really do. So as long as this pattern is being followed by passwords, it's worth an adversary's time to go after them. It is going to profit them to continue attacking. Uh, 
So hopefully uh, we can find a way to stop this and get ourselves into a better situation. So next we'll take a look at the question of, uh, of memory hard functions and can these actually help? So everything that we've talked about now and all of the functions were hash iteration. That's again, just the hash of hash of hash method. Um, why are these so cheap and why is this working? Uh, well, it's possible to use custom hardware, hardware to calculate these very quickly. Whereas say if you are, um, if you're, uh, I don't know, Facebook or something, you have basically standard servers that are, um, that are going to be running here. They're using general purpose equipment uh, and not the same equipment that's being used by an attacker. Uh, so can we actually stop them from doing this? Can we force them to basically be on the same playing field that everyone is? Uh, and the answer is, um, yeah, we can use memory hard functions to do this. What are they? They are functions that take a large amount of memory to compute. By large amount, um, we can talk hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes in this case to compute these functions. Um, and the amount of memory used is a parameter just like time tends to be. So while computation time is faster with specialized hardware, memory accessing is not. Uh, that is, especially when you're dealing with gigabytes, um, the amount of time it's going to take an attacker to access some location is RAM, in RAM is going to be the same amount of time that it's going to take you to go and access. And so what you're going to do is you're going to make that the bottleneck uh, rather than computation time. Question. Yes. Uh, is this memory hard fun are these memory hard functions will uh, make the authentication process much more expensive for the um, regular server, let's say, to authenticate a regular user? Uh, in terms of memory, yes. It is going to be more expensive. As I said, these could use maybe hundreds of megabytes and a gigabyte um, to compute, uh, which of course is more than is currently used. So the, um, I mean, if an adversary has to pay it, you also have to pay it when you're calculating it. So in terms of memory, yes. Um, and with these functions, much like with hash iteration, the amount that you're using is not just a fixed amount, it's a parameter that you give. You can say, I want you to use this memory hard function use two gigabytes of RAM to do this. That's just something that you put in. So it varies a bit. You can adjust the cost uh, according to what you have. Uh, but in terms of memory, yes, it does. Anything an adversary has to pay, you have to pay as well when you are doing this. Uh, but hopefully I'll convince you it's worth it. Uh, why are we gonna use them? Uh, so while it does increase computation cost in terms of memory, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to pay a large penalty in terms of computation time. Uh, so we're going to rework our model a little bit. Earlier, I was saying that the cost k is just t times whatever the hash function costs. I'm going to add in one more factor now, which is t squared times whatever the cost of memory is. Uh, so it turns out that memory is going to be, a, uh, it's going to scale quadratically for cost in this case. Uh, and this is an area time, so um, Area complexity times uh, time complexity very roughly. There's a few nuances in there, but that's the general gist of it. We're going to make that a quadratic uh, quadratic case. Uh, we're going to plug in our same costs that we were just using for hash functions. So this is the uh, the more pessimistic for the attacker case of seven times ten to the negative fifteenth to evaluate the base function, and memory we're going to say is about one three thousandth of that. Yes. Why is the R is a square? Why is it square? So it's, uh, a little bit of detail on how these work. When you are doing a memory hard function, it tends to be filling an array, essentially. And for on each cycle, you're going to fill in one cell uh, using up t array units for t time, essentially. And this ends up being quadratic, is where this comes from. So this is area time complexity, not time complexity. We're using both right here. So t units of memory for t units of time gives us our squared factor right here. All right, so uh, we can actually plot this and try to see what sort of advantages we have going. Uh, so what you're looking at right here are the effects of what we have. And this is not, uh, not looking at value right here. What we have on the y-axis is the estimated number of passwords that are going to be cracked versus on the bottom just how difficult we're making it. What's our, our t parameter? And what you can see, so on the right, we have our, um, our non-memory hard function versions. And on the left, we do have the memory hard uh, functions. Uh, and in this case, left is good, right is bad. 
uh, and we can get, uh, essentially we can save a lot more people with a lot less work. Um, I mean, we're not going to hit zero here because no amount of security is going to protect the person who picks one, two, three, four, five, six as their password. Uh, but uh, we actually can really start saving a good number of people here. So uh, just to give an example um, of just how much less work you need to do to protect the same number of people, let's just say that we are, uh, we're trying to protect 80% of people, so we're only going to allow 20% to be cracked. If we're looking at a memory hard function, we need to run this for about 250 milliseconds, um, which isn't too much time. Uh, you can imagine a server handling this. Um, and you're probably not going to blink an eye. You're not going to care too much if you have to wait a quarter second uh, to log in. If we want the same level of protection without this, it's going to take two minutes. Uh, and while you are willing to wait for the memory hard function, I don't think that you're willing to sit there and wait two minutes to log into every single thing uh, that you can. You're just going to run away, and you're going to start using whatever service is actually going to be fast and usable and accessible to you. So uh, in some ways, we do actually need to worry about uh, are users even willing to tolerate these delays? So if you want to keep them safe with hash iteration, no, they're not really going to tolerate that delay. It's way too much. But with memory hard functions, we're really looking at uh, pretty reasonable computation times here for, uh, for protection. Uh, so to kind of sum it all up, uh, what have we done today? I've described basically this, this adversary who is interested in making a profit, an economic adversary who's doing an offline password attack. Uh, we actually presented, this is the strongest evidence to date that passwords actually do follow Zip's law. Um, the depressing thing is that the amount of key stretching used in practice right now is often insufficient to actually protect users from these offline attacks. Uh, so recommendations we give as a result of this, we actually recommend that NIST standards be updated. We want to disallow pbkdf2, which is one of those hash iteration functions, and we want it to be required uh, to use memory hardness. At the moment, they actually offer two options. They do say that you could use pbkdf2 or another memory hard function, uh, but we would uh, recommend that the hash iteration be axed and you, uh, you require this memory hardness. And we also do recommend that, uh, that NIST standards also be updated to recommend something called distributed hashing, which is just uh, another method of preventing this whole mess from happening in the first place. Yeah? All right, let me try to summarize the last mm -hmm. three slides. So what you're saying is with memory hard function, which will put a memory cost on both <clears throat> the user as well as the attacker, what will happen is the amount of time that it requires the attacker to check out each password will take that much longer because of the memory requirements. Yeah. So if I jump back to here, um, but isn't it previously just, isn't as... It just, I'm sorry, isn't it just an economic cost of buying more memory for the attacker? Uh, it's a, a time cost, essentially. Um, so because we have this, this cost, essentially, for, for using memory, essentially, which is scaling quadratically, um, it's, it is essentially just making it more expensive to them. Um, I, I, sorry, can you rephrase that, that question? I mean, I think I got it. So what you're saying is the memory hardening increases the time cost to the attacker. Time and monetary cost as Time well. and monetary cost, mm -hmm. which in turn just makes it yeah. less profitable. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it makes it more expensive to them um, simply due to that, that extra memory cost. And, and on, on what scale does it do it? What do you mean on, on what scale? So, <clears throat> so you have the memory heart function curve on the left. Mm -hmm. if, if it wasn't memory hard function and it was just whatever they're using now in terms of multiple hashing, how much time does it multiply with the memory hard function over Com what it currently takes? Over what it currently takes? Yeah. Um, we can see it's 250 milliseconds for a memory hard function. A normal yeah. crack would take how long? Sorry, what was the last bit? The normal cracking of a typical hashing function today, how long does that take? For just the standard ones to do it. Uh, so Ant Miner can do 14 trillion per second. Um, so one 14 trillionth of a second okay. per one. So multiply that by whatever parameter they're using for the time. Uh, however, the key with memory hard function is we don't let them 
essentially cheat and get away with one fourteen trillionth of a second, we do bump them up to uh, the same cost that you are hopefully playing, uh, paying. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas the modern type techniques used in uh, second factor authentication, like a ha hardware backed authentication scheme, will will password cracking be still so profitable, or is it just based on the assumption that user doesn't use second factor? Um, so everything we've talked about today isn't looking at second factor uh, authentication. Uh, that's an interesting question. I don't know. It may be something that we can look at in the future. But yeah, today we're we're thinking about users who are not using that. Right, uh, it's just a, a straight up attack. I mean, the most the most straightforward thing that I can think of for deploying such a defense mechanism in a service is to first to begin with to disallow those easy password right bef before the user even have the chance to set it up. Mm -hmm. The second will be um, having some other factor of authentication, like using either dedicated hardware or dynamically generated uh, code being sent via another source, another channel. Um, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, I, there are other defenses you can employ against offline attacks. That's right. So, um, I mean, you mentioned disallowing certain passwords. How exactly you do that is a whole other can of worms and could probably be another hour long presentation. Uh, yeah, I mean, but in terms of second factor, is it another way to, to prevent these? Yes. Um, but if you really do look at all of these breaches that we're looking at, none of these actually had that in there. Um, and a lot of these breaches actually are situations where we are not dealing with second factor authentication. So it's a case that happens, essentially, is what we want to say. Well, and these are offline. Whereas yes, second, it's offline. Two factor would be online. No, I mean, even, even if you've cracked the password, you know what the correct password mm -hmm. is, you can't access the account. That's the point. Yeah. So you need a second factor to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. Second factor, it's, it's just another defense, essentially, uh, but one that we are not looking at here. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for listening. All right, thank you. That's all I have.